I want to read three passages in the gospel by Matthew. It will become very apparent why they are in my mind. Matthew chapter 17, when the Lord Jesus was on the mount that we call the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter and, well, particularly Peter as the spokesperson, suggested that they build three booths, one for Moses and Elias who had appeared and one for the Lord Jesus. When he said that, this is what happened. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them and behold, a voice out of the cloud, which said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, arise and be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man except Jesus only. Then earlier in the gospel in chapter eight, the Lord Jesus entered into the town of Capernaum and a Roman centurion approached him and begged him saying, Lord, my servant lies at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus said unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldst come under my roof, but speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, go, and he goeth, and to another, come, and he cometh, and to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, verily, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And he turned to the centurion and said, go thy way. And as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And his servant was healed in the selfsame hour. And then finally, in Matthew 14, we read, that when they, that is the Lord Jesus and his disciples, came into the land of Genesaret, the men of that place had knowledge of him, and they sent out into all the country round about and brought unto him all that were diseased. And they besought him that he they might touch the hem of his garment, and as many as touched were made perfectly whole. Now, that may seem like three disconnected readings, but it'll be a very simple message that I would like to communicate with you tonight. I read to you in Matthew chapter 17, Jesus only. And then in Matthew chapter eight, the word only, his word only. And then in Matthew 14, a touch only. Only Jesus, only the word, only a touch. And I think in these three statements, we will have three important questions answered. The first is, who can save me? And the answer to that is of course, Jesus only. That it tells us about the, uh, the uniqueness, the singularity of God's salvation, Jesus only. But when we think about the statement, speak the word only, that answers. I mentioned the disciples made the mistake of elevating mere men, Moses and Elijah, to the level of the Son of God. The Lord Jesus stands alone. When it comes to salvation, he is the sole source, Jesus only, or as we often sing with children in the Sunday school, Jesus alone. Jesus alone can save. Here are a few of many Bible verses that stress that truth. Acts chapter four and verse 12, the apostles preached, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. John chapter 14 and verse six, the Lord Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the father except by me. In John chapter 10 and verse 9, again, the Lord Jesus made one of those sweepingly exclusive statements. I am the door. By me, if anyone enter in, he shall be saved. The apostle John, knowing these truths, wrote these words to the Christians. He that has the son of God has life. And he that does not have the son of God does not have life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the son of God, that ye may know that you have eternal life life. Christ is the only means of salvation. He is the only mediator between God and mankind. Of course, that should be understood by us because there's no one else who died for our sins and was buried and rose again. No one else shared in that mighty work of redemption because no one else could. It is Jesus alone. Some years ago, during a lecture at Princeton University, a visiting speaker fielded questions from the assembled students when he was done speaking. Now, the speaker was a Christian and he was a preacher. Consequently, one of the students asked him, don't you believe that God has revealed himself in other religions beside Christianity? 
The answer the speaker gave stunned the students because this is what he said. God has never revealed himself in any religion, including Christianity. He revealed himself in his son. Now, there were two men that came from heaven and were on either side of the Lord Jesus on that mountain. One was Moses. So think about Moses for a moment and the topic of redemption. Moses had once been sent to redeem the Israelites out of the land of Egypt. He provided redemption merely from Egyptian bondage. When he led them out of Egypt, they were freed from slavery to the Egyptians. But Christ redeems from sin and from hell. He redeems both the soul and the body of a person who believes in him. His redemption is extensive and eternal. Moses provided redemption through the blood of another. A lamb had to die, or in the case of Exodus chapter 12, lambs died and blood was shed. But the Lord Jesus redeemed sinners by means of his own blood. That is why the Bible says we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. That is why the Bible says the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, cleanses from all sin. This is the salvation that he has provided for you. Moses brought them out of Egypt, but after that, he couldn't meet their needs. They needed water. They needed food. They were traveling through a, a number of deserts on the way to Canaan. The Lord Jesus reminded the people that it was not Moses who gave the people that bread from heaven. That, that was God's kind gift. But the Lord Jesus says he is the living bread. He meets the spiritual and daily needs of every person who has trusted him and therefore is saved. I have been at a number of funerals and was at one just last week of a person who was saved and who died. And I've noticed that very often at Christian funerals, believers will sing and they will sometimes sing a hymn requested by the person who died, left the, the request before passing into heaven. But it reminded me of this. A number of years ago, a man named Colonel Robert Ingersoll devoted his life to destroying the faith of people who believed in the Bible and believed in God. He would have public meetings where he would get up on the stage and he would preach against God, preach against the Bible, preach against Christ. Now, Robert Ingersoll died and the brochure for his funeral service carried this statement. There will be no singing. There will be no singing. How could you sing at the funeral of a man who fought against God all his life? It is Christ who brings joy to the human heart. It is Christ who brings the assurance of a home in heaven, even when a person is coming to the end of the road. You'll remember that Moses brought them to the very borders of the land of Canaan, but he could not bring them in. However, the Lord Jesus saves to the uttermost. The picture he gave is of a shepherd seeking a lost sheep. And when he finds that lost sheep, he places it on his shoulders and he brings it safely home to his home, to his house. It is the picture of the full, complete and eternal salvation that the Lord Jesus offers. There is no church. There is no organization. There are no group of people on the face of the planet who can give you that salvation. It is Jesus alone. A number of years ago, there was um, a woman coming to meetings that I was having in London, Ontario. She is very unique in my memory because she was the only person I ever met who said that she was a Babylonian from the city, the town of Babylon, from that area. Her name was Magdisi, Nazi Magdisi. She got saved in those meetings. That was in 1997. I believe she is now gone. She is in heaven. But she found out in those meetings that salvation was through the Lord Jesus. Her English, of course, was broken, and uh, you needed to listen very carefully, but this is what she said. Jesus only, nobody else. Jesus only, not Mary, nobody else. Jesus only. That is the one thing she grasped in those meetings, that salvation was only through Christ. I hope you'll grasp that tonight. Think about the other man, Elijah, and the topic of regeneration. He had once been sent to reform the nation. In fact, Elijah, in a very famous passage of our Bible, he offered a sacrifice to God and he called on God to send fire to consume the sacrifice. What a difference. The Lord Jesus offered himself as a sacrifice. He gave himself. The apostle Paul wrote, the son of God loved me and he gave himself. That is in sacrifice. He, he gave himself for me. He gave himself as a sacrifice 
and he endured the fire of judgment that fell on him at Calvary so that he might save you from going to the lake of fire. Elijah's reformation was short-lived, but the Lord Jesus doesn't offer to reform. He offers to transform. He will give you new life. That life in the Bible is called eternal life or everlasting life. He purchased that gift and it is offered freely through Jesus Christ, our Lord. You can be saved by Jesus only because he is the only savior. Nikolai Lenin was named the father of communism. He died in 1924. I have not been to Moscow. I've not been to Russia, but his body is on display in Red Square. And I am told that there is still this inscription next to his remains, quote, he was the greatest leader of all people of all time. He was the Lord of the new humanity. He was the savior of the world. He was the savior of the world. Let me tell you something about that Russian savior of the world. When he unleashed his revolution on that mighty nation, he said that he would not make the mistake they made in the French Revolution. They didn't kill enough people in the French Revolution. He intended to make sure he killed enough people that his revolution would stick. Now, let me tell you about the real savior of the world. He said, I came that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Please, if nothing else I say tonight remains with you, will, will you please allow these two words to stay in your memory? Only Jesus. He is the only one who can save you. I think that Matthew chapter eight answers the question, how can a person know that he or she is saved? Now we're dealing with the certainty of salvation. You remember, remember what happened. The centurion came to the Lord Jesus. His servant was sick and the Lord Jesus said, I will go with you. But the man said, I don't deserve for you to come. But he said, I understand the chain of command. I'm a man in authority. I understand that the people under me have to obey me. And of course, the implication is people above me. I have to listen to them. And he says to the Lord Jesus, all that you need to do is speak the word. Do you realize that he understood that the Lord Jesus had such authority and power that in one place he could say the word and miles away. That word would have its effect. You see, the Lord Jesus has the power to fulfill his promises and carry out his word. In creation, we are told that the Lord Jesus spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. Now, in salvation, he similarly gives his word that all who trust him will be saved. Let me quote that for you. John chapter five and verse 24. He said, verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say to you, he that hears my word and believes God that sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death to life. Some years ago in New York City, not far from where this broadcast is originating, a woman was knifed to death by her husband as she stood at a bus stop. Now she had obtained a court order of protection. She had made the mistake not to have him jailed, but she had that order of protection in her handbag when he came up to her and killed her. That court order was not able to protect her. But the Lord Jesus has the authority and power to save you and to keep you. The reason why you can trust him, think about the veracity and truth of his words. You see, some person might have authority and power to enforce their word, but that does not necessarily mean that their word is true. But God cannot lie. And every word of God is true. If, if you trusted the word of God tonight, you would be resting your soul on the highest authority in the universe. Everything that God speaks can be trusted because it is true. He is the God of truth. The Bible is called the scriptures of truth. This is why the apostle Paul said in words that appeared in the intro, in case you happen to be listening and watching, this is a faithful saying and worthy of everyone's acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am foremost. Did you catch Paul's initial words? It's a faithful saying. It's a true saying, and it deserves to be accepted by everyone that Christ came to save sinners because God cannot lie and because he has the ability and authority to carry out his word therefore his word is reliable you can have every confidence in trusting his word tonight on one occasion the Lord Jesus made one of those 
incredible statements that would be ludicrous in the lips and mouth of any other human being. Do you know what he said? Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. My words, he said, shall not pass away. In the Old Testament, the prophet Isaiah wrote these words, trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Yahweh is a rock of ages. And that is why the Bible says that the person that believes on the Lord Jesus shall not be ashamed. That person is trusting an authority that is reliable and trustworthy and authoritative. I don't know if you've ever seen Lake Huron. There are places where I've stood on Lake Huron where it looked to me like it was a, an ocean, huge. But there was a killer storm, as it's called, in 1913, November 7th to 9th, to be precise. 30 ships and 235 sailors were lost. It was the worst storm in Canadian history. Now, augmenting the problem, making it worse, was that there was a light ship that is a floating lighthouse, a ship with a with a sort of like a, a tower on it, a lighthouse that was driven ashore by the waves. And so many other ships seeing this light and steering by its light ran aground as well. You see, that light was subject to the same forces that were driving the ships to their wreckage. You would need a lighthouse that was on shore, that was not affected by the waves. When a person trusts what God says, he is not resting on shifting sand, to change the analogy. He is not resting on something that's subject to further information and further education and further knowledge. This is the word from God who knows everything. And he is offering you his promise. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. How could you have any higher authority than that? So let me close by pointing out to you that the third passage, Matthew chapter 14, answers the question, when? When exactly is a person saved? And I think that you will catch the simplicity in the words, only a touch, just a touch. No one needed to wrap their arms around the Lord Jesus. No one needed to have him come to their home. All they needed to do was get in contact with him. Of course, it was a scene of human misery. All around the Lord Jesus, there were people who were diseased and were dying. Now, it does remind us that spiritually, we all have a variety of need. We don't all sin the same way. Sin doesn't manifest itself in the same way in everyone. It is very subtle. Someone may be very proud that he does not drink or use drugs, that he's not a murderer, and yet he might be filled with pride and self-righteousness. Someone else may be crude and coarse and, and violent, but say, at least I'm not a hypocrite. We, we, all, we all have excuses for how we live, and yet we all sin, even though we sin in different ways. And you'll catch that picture in people all around, somewhere near to death, someone perhaps were just initially ill. There was a variety, but they all were in need. And then there came this healing moment, as many as touched him. I think those are significant words because in John chapter one, those words are used about you and me. It says that as many as receive the Lord Jesus, to them he gives the power to become the children of God. If you are familiar with the, the woman who touched the hem of his garment, you will remember that there was a woman who for 12 years had been hemorrhaging, getting weaker and weaker. She visited doctor after doctor and had sought help everywhere she could. She had run right through all the money she had. She now had nothing left. Thank God she arrived, arrived at the point where with no money to pay for any other medical help, she realized I need to go to Christ. And you remember that she made her way through the crowd and she must have been repeating to herself, if I might just touch, if I could just touch the hem of his garment. And there were people jostling. And, and uh, in fact, the disciples realized that the, the, the crowd had come very, very close. They were, they were being constricted like you would be if you were driving on the Jersey Turnpike and they were closing down one lane. The crowd had come very, very close. And then this woman reaches out and grabs just the hem of his garment. And, an, and immediately she is made well because she trusted him. She came to him. Please remove from your thinking any idea that this all depends on how well you believe or what you give him or how you live. It is Jesus only who saves. 
It is by his word only that a person can know he or she is saved. And all it takes is just a touch. Just a sinner simply believing on Christ, realizing that he did the work. He is the savior. He accomplished everything and that he is calling on me simply to trust him. And remember, as many as touched him were made perfectly whole. I remember reading about a gospel preacher named Reginald Radcliffe. This is going back now to the uh, 19th century. After a gospel meeting, he was speaking to a number of people that had questions. And there was a woman who seemed to be trying to get his attention. And when he was done speaking to those who had come to him, he turned to her and he said, yes, what can I do for you? What do you want? And she said, I want peace. Now, please do not think he was rude. He was a wise evangelist. When she said, I want peace, he said to her, oh, I thought it was Christ you wanted. I'm sorry. Good night. And he left. Now, she went away annoyed because she felt that his answer had in some ways just uh, turned her aside. But then she began to think of words that she had heard in the meeting that Christ is our peace from Ephesians chapter two. Christ is our peace. And she thought to herself, if I have Christ, I will have everything. I will have peace. I will have life. I will have salvation if I have Christ. And she realized instead of searching for something. She needed to trust someone. And I hope that you tonight will find peace and life and hope and joy and security and assurance by trusting Christ as your Savior.